knife them all out! Kill them with my bare hands! What is the cost? Well, the, the cost is the cost is polygamy. And so we rein that in with enforced monogamy. Because that means everybody's on the outside and a lot of times are giving you advice in their best interest, not yours. So how do you differentiate? I just don't listen to anybody. I'll just keep moving forward. <laughs> Till I killed my enemies. If you're not charismatic or funny, people aren't gonna watch. So we make jokes all the time. We make fun of Spanish girls, white girls, Asian, Asian girls, girls, all that shit, bro. Me love you long time. We do all these jokes. <laughs> Ring, like, ring. no one bats a fucking eye. We make fun of them, bro. But as soon as we say, yeah, we don't date the Shaniquas, ha, ha, ha. We don't dabble in the dark. Oh, my God. It feels like we left off the last video in a bit of a weird spot. Timing and technical difficulties kind of made it impossible to create a useful transition into this video. And over the last few weeks, as I did more writing and research, I ended up writing a script that was nearly 20,000 words long as this part two, which was just too much, too much to make a coherent video, too much to address the things I wanted to address effectively. I know all of you like super long videos, but I'm not quantum reviews. So I'm just going to put it out there now that if you're here specifically to hear my takes on Kevin Samuels and the deepest parts of the black manosphere, you're going to have to wait a couple of months probably because that's been put on the back burner. I only talked about the black manosphere for all of like 15 minutes and this garnered a nice amount of content from them, including a four hour round table from what I'm sure are three of the most popular and charismatic black man you'll ever meet. Those who offer any critiques to it at all or perceived as misogynistic, sexist, transphobic, uh, you know. Uh... But you're gonna have to wait for a real response because now that I've kicked that hornet's nest, I want to give those guys in particular the appropriate amount of attention and not just have it be a specific piece of a larger puzzle because it's its own unique organism. So you guys, you know who you are. You can close the video. So Kevin Samuel slander, et cetera, got cut out, but you see the timeline. We still have plenty to do. This video will still be looking at the Manosphere in general and present my views and assessments on what it is, why it is, and what to do about it. I will explain why I think hustle culture grifter Gary V is connected to everyone's favorite kooky racist uncle Jordan Peterson and how all of that connects somehow to Attack on Titan. But before that, I do think I need to review some of the main points from the last video just in case. First, while many think of the Manosphere as a space where people learn how to pick up women or complain about women or live life without women or why we should take away rights from women, etc., I argue that all of this stuff from the benign to the extreme is connected to a concept called hegemonic masculinity, first introduced by sociologist R.W. McConnell. In short, hegemonic masculinity is a framework that explains why men dominate society and more importantly, what types of men or what features of men tend to dominate in a given space at a given time. For the sake of brevity, the Chad, as we've come to know him in internet culture, is what we might call the hegemonic ideal. And anything less than a Chad is lower on the hierarchy. All males, regardless of race, economic, sexual orientation, or presentation, are expected on some level to aspire to be a Chad as much as possible. The further you are from Chad, for whatever reason, the lower you are on the social hierarchy, and the more exposed you may be to social sanction, bullying, ostracism, etc. This is a massive, massive oversimplification of a very complex concept, so I'll be leaving some links in the description if you want further research on this concept. Another thing I talked about is how being far from that hegemonic space, that Chad ideal, but still internally believing in it and desiring it and externally being sanctioned for not having it, this can lead to a sense of what sociologist Michael Kimmel calls aggrieved entitlement. Kimmel states that men, especially white men and boys, are socialized to think that they will all be the stars of their own stories, that as long as they appropriately perform masculinity, the rewards of being a good man or a nice guy, such as getting girls, getting respect, being successful, etc., will come to them. 
However, this is not the case and has never been the case. Once the reality of this not being real settles in, a sense of resentment can build up as young boys and men begin to recognize that their social contract has been broken. As I wrote, I realized that this is akin to what many might call the red pill, being awakened to the reality of what gender performance really is for men and boys. And I argue that this is where you begin to see the development of nihilistic or antisocial ideologies in some men, AKA edgy boy behavior, when they don't have the best coping strategies for this realization. There's a lot more to that video. It was over 90 minutes long, but those are the core elements I need you all to kind of get that lead into my main argument for this video, where I really start to dig into the manosphere as a whole. More than anything, the manosphere is about reifying and affirming the status quo especially as it pertains to men. The status quo tells us that men should be this assortment of traits society has deemed appropriate for men. In fact, not being this assortment of traits as a man is why you're unhappy. And more importantly, my product, which you can find here on the Manosphere, whether it be advice, some type of content, a special soap, a vitamin regimen, a special type of workout, whatever it is, can help you be better at this assortment of masculine traits. Or more concerningly, my product will show you how it will be easier to be all those traits if it weren't for those insert marginalized group here. And this is why, despite not generally being considered a part of the Manosphere, I would begin describing the Manosphere by talking about a guy like Gary V. Thought Slime just did an excellent video examining Gary V that I'll link in the description. But in short, Gary V, a motivational speaker, entrepreneurial guru, business guy, whose basic game boils down to work really hard, make yourself miserable, do whatever you can to build a business and a brand, do all of that and nothing else in 10 years, and then somehow this will make you Rich. This is an oversimplification of what he sells, but not not really. I'm on a hot no excuses kick. I have a lot of female yeah. entrepreneurs. I have a lot of fans that are African Americans. I spent a lot of time in that community in my college years. I just think I'm giving the best advice to women and minorities in business today, which is tough. Wow. To me, V represents the Manosphere entryway where tons of normal men and boys might pay a visit to at some point in their life, the world of men's self-help. They might just be looking to escape the rat race that is normal work or improve their salesmanship or start a business or dress better, get bigger muscles, etc. And in doing so, they may come across a lot of self-help bro philosophy figures who offer that type of advice to boys and men. And the thing that we have to contend with for this space and the Manosphere as a whole is that a lot of this stuff is useful, helpful, and important, especially for normal men and boys who have weaker social skills or may have been lacking to certain type of knowledge that can be passed on from other men in their communities or are just in need of explicit instruction or motivation to make certain changes in their lives. The world of men's self-help by itself isn't a problem. The problem is that many of the foundational ideas that permeate this space can prime these boys and men for worse things later on in life by emphasizing ideologies and tactics that can be harmful both to them and the people around them in the long run. Bad advice is abundant in any self-help venue, no matter the gender. I truly believe that it, that every person can make a thousand dollars a week by waking up at five o'clock in the morning, garage sailing on a Saturday for four hours, and then posting the stuff they find on eBay. So while at this level of the manosphere, you might get things that are typical of the bro philosophy self-help space, such as NFT, Bitcoin bros, Sigma grind set stuff, dopamine detox, no, detox, dopamine detox, no fap, et cetera type of stuff is all through here. And on the grand scale, while most of this stuff is awful, these are still really just goofballs trying to make sense of the world around them and survive this hellscape like the rest of us, except with maybe kind of bad and toxic ideas. Dan Olsen speaks on this a bit in his Line Goes Up video about NFTs. He talks about how the eroding sense of safety and strength of the modern labor market and the continued narrowing of the promises of the American dream that hard work and talent are what will make you rich and successful don't quite work. The basic psychological profile of the average buyer is someone who is tenuously middle class, socially isolated, and highly responsive to mean. Being tenuously middle class gives them enough disposable income to engage with a pretty expensive system, but also a very potent anxiety about their financial future. 
Ultimately, the driving forces underlying this entire movement are economic disparity. The wealthy and tenuously wealthy are looking for a space that they can dominate, where they can be trendsetters and tastemakers and can seemingly invent value through sheer force of will. And that's how it draws in the bottom. People who feel their opportunities shrinking, who see the system closing around them, who have become isolated by social media and a global pandemic, who feel the future getting smaller. People pressured by the casualization of work as jobs are dissolved into the gig economy and want to believe that escape is just that easy. All that bootstrap rhetoric has really never been real in this country, but it's even less real in 2022 than it was in 1972. Aside from the fact that a lot of these guys aren't necessarily hard workers or talented in the first place, those who are hard workers or are talented still see how the most predictive factors of being wealthy and successful in the world we live in today is usually coming from wealth and success in the first place. So many of the iconic mogul type guys that are in this circle, such as Gary Vee, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, etc., come from either a significant wealth or at least a pretty good head start. But their fans still follow and emulate them, hoping that despite not having rich parents that can pass a business on to you, can help them find the same success. Money and status is a key component to ideal hegemonic masculinity. A man with power and money doesn't have to be good looking or have a great personality to attract women. And he will be respected by everyone regardless. Don't you want that? Don't you want to be an alpha? Well then follow me on Twitter, buy my book, sign up for my seminars and get my life coaching. And don't forget to sign up for this NFT thing. I don't know how NFTs work, but I know you have to like join because I get a lot of alerts on Twitter. It's it's awful. I want to reiterate that most of this stuff is very normal and the vast majority of men in this Gary Vee section are normal dudes just trying things out and they shouldn't be attacked for that. I am not trying to cancel masculine coded things that people like and want to research in communities that develop around them. I'm not trying to cancel hiking or manscaped. I said that as a joke, but also because what you'll often hear from right wing and reactionary supporters of the Manosphere and Manosphere type rhetoric is that the woke mob and the SJWs just want to stop men from being men eating meat and watching football. Eminem's will not be satisfied until every last cartoon character is deeply unappealing and totally androgynous. Until the moment you wouldn't want to have a drink with any one of them. No, that's not the case. And I say that as a gun owning, football loving, barbecue enthusiast. But what I do want to point out is that all of these spaces still present a very hegemonic and commodifiable image of what idealized masculinity looks like. The packaging of it all speaks to principles of what masculinity should be and how it should present to the world. You don't see many wild stallions anymore. While these types of spaces don't hold really any explicitly negative elements in them, they prime the pump for those who consume this type of content to be more easily taken in by the bad faith actors that exist in other spaces. They reinforce the appeal of hegemonically masculine identity and performance and sell to boys and men that they will only really be happy if they can be more like these types of men. In short, they're all about affirming and selling the status quo for what masculinity is and should be. Here's a really important thing to get about this concept in general. Do not mistakenly conflate high performance of masculinity with happiness and wholeness. And do not assume that men who have access to certain privileges through these frameworks are somehow immune to the struggles and barriers of late capitalist dysfunction. There are definitely many benefits and rewards to high masculine performance under patriarchy, regardless of race, but even the men who have the highest aptitude for performing masculinity can find themselves in hollow and unfulfilling lives. There's lots of media that actually does a good job of deconstructing this, by the way. It's just that I don't think people fully get the message or that the message is drowned out. Notable pickup artist Neil Strauss became famous in the mid 2000s after he wrote a book about the underground world of pickup artistry at that time. It eventually even got a reality TV show. And he got tons of women and became rich and very successful in the process. 
but his life was in shambles even after getting married and trying to settle down. He dealt with sex addiction and struggled mightily in his marriage before getting divorced. And after this, he wrote a follow-up book nearly 10 years later where he cautioned against his previous glamorizing of the high value man lifestyle that he lived. So you've had a change of heart. I guess sometimes you have to hit a real low. And for me, it was meeting someone I cared about, being really in love with this person, or so I thought. Mm -hmm. Then cheating on her, getting caught, and you know, breaking the heart of someone who loves you and hurting her that much that I started to think, well, maybe I'm just completely wrong about everything. To further clarify that the lifestyle that he was living wasn't ideal or high value or to be glamorized anymore because, well, that's the mistake he made in the first place. But when you're convinced that this life is what you want and need, you miss the lessons that people who've been there are trying to give you. It's like when I was an undergrad or just the early 2000s for those millennials who remember that time frame. if you were in college, and you were a guy, you probably had a Scarface poster on your wall. But people never remember the end of the Scarface movie. So wrapping it up, I don't have a lot to say about Gary Vee, obviously, but it's more about the section of the manosphere that he represents, that gateway drug of the manosphere. Men just seeking help, trying to make their lives better, and sadly, they open themselves up to being grifted, gaslit, and possibly even dragged deeper into the manosphere from that point. So if you clicked on this video after seeing that runtime, there's a strong chance that you might just be a fan of analytical analysis videos in the form of video essays, commentary, or straight up documentaries. There's also a strong chance that you follow several other educational style YouTubers and would like more of their content, but maybe with less ad breaks or even this particular commercial happening in the middle of the video. If that's the case, you may be interested in Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service made by creators like me who have all come together to make content that is mostly free of the many restraints that we often encounter on YouTube, such as a very complicated copyright strike system, having multiple ads running through your videos, or actual sponsored sections that break up the video in general. At Nebula, creators are making their content free of those restraints, but also making original content explicitly for the Nebula platform. For example, the Working Title series, which is a series of videos exclusive on Nebula that features some of your favorite creators, doing analysis videos related to some of your favorite pieces of media and looking at the core components of their opening segments. In fact, next month, one from yours truly about the boondocks should be premiering. Before the black nerd explosion of the last decade, where gaming and anime have now become staples of hip hop and urban culture, Magruder was an unassuming, thoughtful young black man making a huge splash in the world of cartoonists with his highly controversial comic strip. If Nebula at all interests you, you probably are also interested in Curiosity Stream, another independent streaming service that features thousands of independent documentaries on a variety of subjects from history to sociology to culture to animals to science. So we're talking tens of thousands of hours of educational content by both professional documentarians and your favorite YouTubers. And you can get the entire thing for a full year for less than $15 by using the promo code FDSignifier or clicking the link in the description. By doing this, you not only support the channel, you help allow creators like myself, as well as independent documentarians, maintain their indie spirit and keep making the type of content that we want to make that you want to see. So I want to say thank you so much to Curiosity Stream and the people at Nebula for sponsoring this video and back to the video. If I told you I was going to talk about two black men who have a large following of mostly young males and talk about a lot of modern issues, usually pertaining to women and are emblematic with some of the major issues I have with the Manosphere, you probably think I was talking about Fresh and Fit. Fresh and Fit obviously are a very popular target here on Left Tube, and for obvious reasons, they're fucking awful. But I don't have a lot to add to a Fresh and Fit discussion. I went on record in saying that they're just so bad, I don't care. I understand they're harmful, I'm not trying to undermine that. I just don't care. Talking about them to me feels like a waste of time. But I think more can be learned and understood about the Manosphere by looking at a much less toxic, but still very problematic black duo in Abbott and Preach. In case you haven't figured it out yet, 
what I do better than anybody is adapt. Last night was plan A, tonight plan B. There's always a plan B. Not too far from the benign goofiness of the Gary V group is the elusively toxic Abbott and Preach group. Except I imagine that the age range for the Gary V community skews a bit older because it's such a wide swath of different types of men and boys looking for help for information. Whereas Abbott and Preach are very much an online and YouTube friendly thing. They make this type of content that is likely to skew younger and more impressionable. It's hard to find reliable demographic data on the channel without knowing the actual metrics, so take that with a grain of salt, but I think it's pretty fair to say that their core demographic probably skews in that late teen, mid 20s range that, you know, probably most of us have. Especially for young men and boys who are seeking creators that offer male-centered perspectives on trending topics. You're a young man and you wanna learn, avoid making mistakes that I made, um, Take some notes. I found ABBA and Preach pretty early on in my own YouTube creator journey because I was looking for black male commentary creators who weren't outwardly toxic. Initially, I was happy to find ABBA and Preach, but it didn't take long to see that while not being outwardly toxic, their content still had a lot of concerning elements. To their credit, and I wanna be clear, we're kind of 50-50 with these guys, and I'm gonna not be 50-50 in the video to illustrate the problem, but I wanna make sure it's clear that there are elements of Abba and Preach I think are redeemable. I just wish those other elements weren't so bad. They tend to take aim at what is an overzealous and often unfair media landscape and general tone around gender from the perspective of men. They see it as often too critical towards men around certain issues. Abba in particular seems to be very invested in calling out elements of hypocrisy in the ongoing gender wars that are popular in social media, as well as TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you want to go. A lot of you guys are feeding into your own perpetual failures in life and then getting mad at the market and shitting on it. Women do it as well. I find it fascinating. Everyone's always blaming everybody else. Men nowadays, women nowadays. No, some of y'all just need to do some self-work and figure your shit out. And it's a lot easier to say it's women. And even women do this. Women get on their TV shows and be like, what's wrong with the men today? Why don't they have their shit together? Because we going through some shit. We are. <laughs> and guess what, ladies? You going through some shit too. <laughs> there is a prominence of feminist rhetoric and wokeness and SJWs that can sometimes have blind spots on how people engage with gender as it pertains to men, including queer and trans men. I will argue with anyone that women know a lot less about men than they think. It's actually hilarious sometimes. There are a lot of situations where from a man's perspective, women sometimes will get passes on overtly toxic, patriarchal, or even homophobic behavior that we wouldn't get. Or that men are sometimes not allowed the space to grow and learn from certain behaviors or mistakes in the public sector, etc. However, there's a lot of nuance that often gets left out of these valid grievances that you know, I don't have time to get into, but you all kind of know what they are. And as I've pointed out in other videos, the problem in the gender wars, black or otherwise, isn't men versus women. It's really everyone versus patriarchy, but that doesn't get the same amount of clicks. And a lot of people hear the phrase patriarchy and decide to shut off their ears, even if everything they're hearing makes perfect sense. It's like telling white people about white supremacy. For younger boys and men weaned under patriarchy and lacking models and frameworks, or in many cases, just the language to engage with these topics around gender effectively, it can feel affirming to see confident and charismatic men, especially black men, speak on some of these anxieties, to call out double standards and make an effort to bring women to task in a way that they often don't see on some of these issues. Okay, so the issue that I, I'm having with this discussion is like, I think it's fine for everyone to talk like this and esoterically, but we do have a crisis, right? We do have an issue with a lot of people who are very likely to die alone, who are basically getting in their own way with some of these ridiculous standards and they face a lifetime of loneliness. So we can get up here and we can be saying all this stuff and it sounds cute, but I'm a pragmatic person. 
I, I think about what's good for society and what's good for communities. And so when I see so many people who are being left behind, to me, it just sounds so sad. Mm -hmm. I hope you guys rethink some of these ideas because even though it may work for you and it may be fine for you, you got three other girlfriends down the street who are gonna die alone. Damn. And that's where it's sad. So that's all I want to say. So having Abba and Preach or numerous similar figures because they are not unique in this style of content, talk about issues of lookism for men or double standards for intimate partner violence or talk about how to better talk to girls or maneuver relationships. Talk about the way men who show emotions outside of aggression and lust are often seen as lesser than. This is valuable. In some ways, it might almost seem that Abbott and Preach are trying to deconstruct hegemony by challenging norms that often aren't challenged. Further, they do also make a lot of content that is critical of the most ridiculous elements of the Manosphere and Alpha Male podcasts and political issues, etc. You preach to these men that they have to always seek this thing, that this is the way to live, that this is the best way, but you don't even walk the talk. That's what I find distasteful. It's like a Derek Jackson talking about be faithful to your wife, don't pay for box, come to find out this man's cheating on everyone. How are you any different? Can you tell me? Now everyone's gonna get up. Well, you know, we're attacking people in the Manosphere. I don't care about the Manosphere. I don't care about none of this. Move with integrity in life. That's it. I'm not here about it, some scene. Oh, you can't go on this podcast. I don't care. At the end of the day, the truth remains the truth. When I came into the game, when I was listening to Patrice, we didn't call it Red Pill. We just called it the truth. These niggas is fronting on some points. On the surface, they may seem like a nice, safe entryway into discourses around social issues, but specifically aimed at men. But sadly, that's really not the most accurate description of them from my perspective or other creators with similar styles of content. It doesn't take long to look at the whole of Abba and Preach's content to see that it closely resembles anti-SJW content that you might have seen during the Gamergate days. A large portion of their content boils down to crazy woman gets owned for stupid things she did. But all the things that got them so triggered. Goodness gracious, we don't want anybody offended. Somebody call the politically correct police. And a significant amount of their content is simply antagonistic towards trans women for cheap view. A lot of this is something that's called straw feminism, which is where someone takes the most extreme or uncharitable interpretation or representation of women or feminism and uses that as an avatar to argue against the entirety of a concept or a gender or a group, etc. It's basically just cringe reaction content where the subjects they tend to tackle a lot are women and girls. I am not of the mind that you can never make jokes at the expense of women. I'm still mad that transphobe Hall of Famer now, Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle, J Dave Chappelle, I'm still mad that Dave Chappelle spent an hour complaining about trans women, but didn't have one joke about the girl that accidentally glued her hair to her head. That's hilarious. But when most of your content is this low vibration, othering comedy about women at their expense, you kind of see that same punching down vibe of something that I think they went on record as saying they don't care much about. And all of it ends up serving a very specific viewpoint and agenda that again supports the status quo. For example, in this video, they make fun of a female soldier who struggles to complete a military test and use that to jump off into a critique of forced gender quotas in general. Watching this video is truly an inspiration to never give up. I feel inspired, but unsafe. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you that. I'm just being real. The other dudes trolled through like it was nothing. There was like a point in the military where they transitioned and were really allowing women to join the forces in droves, but they really wanted to encourage it because from a public relations standpoint, it worked really well. And also to be fair, admitting women in the military was overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. But the way that they pushed some of them through, the success stories that they were trying to paint, yeah. like you would have Marines, right, who are males and who would get passed on for promotions for women who met an inferior standard, yeah. right? even though they were working for the same job. Here they make fun of a vapid girl in a dating show, but make sure to insert the ever-present simping, anti-simping argument that is somehow still a thing in these YouTube streets. I live in California, so I've been around basic women like this before. It's insane how vain they are and unaware as well. But to be fair, dudes are the reason why they're that unaware, because dudes will simp for them anyways. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it's like, it's hard. <laughs> Maybe it's because she's an airhead, but everything she says, I'm just thinking about her lips. And when she goes, uh, it's hard. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Here they make fun of a white feminist doing the white feminism and not minding their own business. Wait, what do you disagree with? You don't think that cat calling could be like a little enjoyable sometimes? It's not. It's disgusting. It's always disgusting? Of course. It's never made you feel good? No. So what's your opinion on these three women disagreeing? 
Um, um, I, there's a camera in front of them, and they're trying to be in the camera. That's it. The hostility is fascinating, isn't it? Women can say one thing, another woman's like, no, no, you're oppressed. You're just doing this for the camera. You can't even have your own opinion as a woman. No. There's valid critiques and important things to maybe talk about in all of these videos. But then you start to recognize that this is a pattern here, a pattern of shallow critiques of outlier worst case scenario moments to kind of make their young male viewers feel affirmed in their distrust and aversion towards anything that somehow connects to feminism or egalitarian issues or any systemic analysis of the social problems that Abba and Preach purport to care about. The end message is that all this feminism stuff is just a bunch of dumb girls talking nonsense. It's like when Fox News wants to talk about a black issue and then they invite four black Republicans with fucked up haircuts to talk about it as if they have well-informed takes when they don't. I'm a common sense guy and a lot of liberals at the moment don't have common sense. Uh, I got a lot of heat from my family and friends for hopping on a Trump train. Somebody explain the hair to me. Just why, bro? I just want to know why. Like, who were you trying to look like? And then, of course, Fox calls it fair and balanced. You can even see through a lot of their thumbnail choices that they are very comfortable leaning into problematic loaded imagery in order to drive views from a very specific population that these types of images appeal to. None of the people depicted in these thumbnails are at all related to the videos in question, but they play into stereotypes about marginalized communities. This is not an accident. Predictably, they save their worst takes when they engage on trans issues, just like everybody else. You really have to resort to attacking another minority community to boost your numbers? Ain't nobody trying to talk about y'all that deeply. You guys just won't shut the fuck up, and you guys are in every news article, always and trying to cancel folks, so of course. Ain't nobody talking about Native Americans or indigenous folks the same way they're talking about you. The reason why folks talk about y'all is because you guys put yourselves out there all the time and then constantly demanding change from everybody. Up until like maybe five, six years ago, the trans stuff wasn't that that common in terms of stand-up comedy. No. Then the pronoun stuff we're happened. Gonna, listen, the we, bathroom we, stuff listen, happened. Listen, we're gonna laugh. We, can, go we laugh. Here. Comedians is the news. If you look at comedy that did not age well, it's a reflection of not the comedy and the comedian, but the era which he lived in. So if you talk a lot and you're all in the news and stuff like that, we're gonna talk about it. Who's to blame for that rise in attention? Trans women are in the news a lot because it makes for good outrage content, like a lot of y'all's content. Because conservatives love to talk about the marginalized group that most people don't understand or see as worthy of protection because they can't attack black people like they used to. Because trans panic stories are low hanging fruit. All right, so here we are for the first or second addendum. I don't know, I'm not doing all of this in order. And I'm here because I wanted to kind of elaborate on this connection between like these reactionary right wing conservative quasi or overtly fascist figures and entities seeking to you know, create political movement by attacking trans people, by attacking queer people, and traditionally by attacking black people. It shouldn't, like if you've been paying attention to politics in the last couple of years from the right, especially in places like Texas and Florida and really states all over the country, you see that for about a year, they were all fighting, well, we got to get rid of critical race theory in the schools. And now they pivoted back to trans women in sports and grooming or whatever other, you know, anti-LGBTQ um, attitudes that they can muster up. And this is not like a coincidence. If you go back a couple of years, the argument was about how Black Lives Matter was a terrorist group and how Antifa was destroying the country and looking to take over America and all kinds of stuff. And I want to like try to draw that through line so people can see it, because when I go back to thinking about how people responded to Dave Chappelle and his transphobic stuff and his comedy special, it was clear to me that a lot of people didn't quite recognize that all of this was a part of the same right wing movement to basically subterfuge political activity into these negative attitudes about these marginal identities. As you pay attention to anything political from the right right now, they're not talking about anything but guns, black people, and queer people. That's it. They don't talk any policy at all. There are no explicit policies around issues that most Americans would care about, 
that are coming from the right. It's just galvanizing people against these marginalized identities. They are relying on people's allegiance to this hegemonic thinking to create momentum for these fascist policies that they are trying to instill for all the things that Trump did beforehand. Because when Trump was doing it, it was Mexicans. It's always a group that they can other. And so the idea that people are okay with othering this other group that's not a part of my group, we we got to stop that. So picking on Abbott and Preach in particular, as well as Jordan Peterson later on in this video about their propensity to align themselves with transphobic movements is a very important thing to point out. And even though Peterson, Abba, and Preach purport to be centrist or aligned with leftist ideologies. The actual action that takes place with these social movements when you align yourself with these regressive attitudes ends up being in service of the right and the far right. That's the thing they need to understand. For a little while back, they commented on a video of trans protesters in Texas getting intense with an openly transphobic congressional candidate. While they are pretty comfortable with calling out the candidate and his beliefs as transphobic, the core of the video and most of its comedy is derived from the aggressive and intense response of the trans protesters. She's 17? He? he? I don't know. I didn't hear what you said. That, I My mean, pronouns are he, he, they. What does that even mean when your pronouns are he, he, they? Well, it's Michael Jackson and a lot of people. <laughs> Later in the video, ABBA goes into a familiar soliloquy of centrist liberals or whatever you want to call them on why they don't understand why people are so mad and why they think yelling and screaming and spitting on people is a useful tactic. Because me going out here screaming, right, or whatever's happening there, it's a waste of time. I'm not saying what he's saying is not important. It absolutely is. I'm not with it. In this instance, like it's more understandable because of how reprehensible the person is, but I've seen these same kind of like protests for like, be it Jordan Peterson, or be it for some Farrell. He goes to the University of Toronto and they lose their mind like They that. don't have to hold the same views as you. They could be against gay marriage. They could be for trans kids. They could be for whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, it's not your place to go protest them all the time. Like, I'm, to me, I just don't understand that. I don't, I don't get that personally. To which Preach thankfully subtly tries to push back. Go don't on. get that. Protesting for people that see humanity, like what Malcolm X did or Abba then makes this comment, which, ugh. Malcolm X did, or? What you mean? MLK did. What you mean? Do you think you think Malcolm X is going to Klan meetings and protesting there? No, I see okay. what you're saying. Okay, that's what you yeah. Like, you all understand that this wasn't a Klan rally. This was an event that happened at their college, which essentially was a message from whoever organized it that they're not really safe there. Furthermore, civil rights activists regularly went into hostile and sometimes dangerous environments. That's how some of them didn't make it back home. Y'all don't know that Malcolm X marched on a literal police precinct in the 60s? My brothers and sisters, we have to put a stop to this. And it will never be stopped until we stop it ourselves. Because me going out here screaming, right? Or whatever's happening there. It's a waste of time. On some level, Abba remembers that this is a person running for a congressional seat that literally wants them to no longer exist and that it's not a matter of pushing their views on other people. It's a matter of survival. My third objective is to outlaw the social transitioning or cross-dressing of children. And this is in a state that's already passed extreme laws that defy the current nationally accepted medical standards on how to treat trans children. Around the time of this video, Texas had passed a law that said that giving any type of support to trans children for transitioning could get your children taken by the state and put into state custody. So imagine being a kid, a trans kid, who's lucky enough to have had a parent that affirms your identity and wants to support you. And just by living your truth, the state can have them arrested and you put in foster care. If you know anything about trans people, you know that there's a high suicide rate that is not caused by the existence of being trans, but it's caused by transphobia, by the constant and persistent misunderstanding, abuse, and outright hatred of the world around you. So laws like this, politicians like this, and videos like this are contributing to that problem. This guy they're not defending, but like not spending nearly enough time talking about, is essentially trying to Thanos snap trans people from existence in the state of Texas. So yeah, you might get spit on for that shit. 
So we could argue about the efficacy of protest or certain types of protest tactics, but by minimizing and mocking them for being rightfully angry and not really going deeper into the context of the situation is pretty gross. So while they don't explicitly endorse many of the destructive and harmful systems that hurt women and trans people, the way they engage on these topics around those issues clearly puts victims of these oppressive and violent systems on the same level of fault as the people actively trying to do violence to them. It's basically this meme. There's too much like demanding that other people conform to your way of viewing the world and seeing things, okay? If it's not your landlord, if it's not your boss, if it's not your teacher or whatever, keep it pushing. We felt it was a affront to, to our own dignity, to our own worth. I don't personally waste my time trying to affirm myself to people who don't see my humanity. No. Okay? We're soliciting the views of all many people on the Civil Rights Bill. Would you like to give us your views? Well, I think if they remain peaceful, it would be a lot better than perhaps the violence that was a concern. What I'm seeing with like a lot of this stuff is that the way that they engage with this stuff is like violent. Mm -hmm. It's violent or extremist. Mm -hmm. And I don't identify with that, even though my politics left. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just like, ugh. I don't even like probably even saying it out loud anymore. They give off a lot of bad people on both sides energy, which obviously for people on the side with the most to lose, doesn't work. In short, Ab and Preach are like a lot of liberals or conservatives in that they are comfortable calling out extreme forms of harm done by bigotry, racism, patriarchy, etc., but are always quick to protect and affirm the status quo and deflect from any systemic analysis of why these problems that they say they care about exist in the first place. Ain't nobody trying to talk about y'all that deeply. You guys just won't shut the f up. Question. When a, when a trans person tells you to suck their dick. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, we're not doing that. No? No, we're not doing that. I was just wondering. Ain't nobody trying to talk about y'all that deeply. In cisgender women, there are naturally differences in their anatomy, in their hormonal levels, in their height. Ain't nobody trying to talk about y'all that deeply. What's the point of words? <laughs> this isn't my wife. This happens to be the first girl I met before I found out there was a great dating market, so now we're married. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, why, why, why is that wife? Because it's not inclusive. Ain't nobody trying to talk about y'all that deeply. At some point, relatively recently, I assume, they got enough pushback that they addressed how they have been covering trans issues and maybe the status quo and centrism in their content to begin with. And that maybe they've come to the realization that they're not doing their best to address these things, which is, you know, good, I guess. But they also inadvertently tell on themselves. The right has always been like the extremists, you know, it's always been like Nazis and shit like that, but they haven't moved. They pretty much stayed whatever the fuck they are. You know what I mean? Over there. And let's say you're in the middle, but left leaning, okay? You're center left leaning. You didn't change because you're center left leaning. And it's the left that moved more to the extreme. And then the more they're going to the left, the more they're looking back at you in the center and they're like, yo, you're closer to the right than us because we're over there. In more than a few videos where they've voiced their annoyance with leftists and the arts and media spaces, who to be fair, can be very annoying. They make great points about the way that white people can often talk down to black people in certain spaces about their knowledge of their own issues. You're gonna be around a lot of people who think they know better than you. Even if they're white, they're gonna tell you, no, as a black man, this is what you should feel. Mm -hmm. As somebody who's been in the arts for the last 12 years, I've heard it all, which is why I'm like really turned off by these people. That's how they operate under the guise of, I know better than you and I'm here with empathy and kindness and I'm here to save you. They will tell you how you should feel. They will gaslight you into thinking you're supposed to be outraged when you aren't. And they'll tell you, wait, that's not a thing. When it's like, who made you the fucking arbiters of what's yeah. right or wrong? That's been my experience with these kind of super progressive types. Just get used to it. They talk about the infamous black square nonsense, but they also low key admit that the reason why they're having issues in these leftist spaces to begin with is because they themselves are conservatives or at least liberals, and they don't seem to realize this. When you hear this statement about them staying in the same place and everyone else moving left, they don't seem to realize that by trying to keep things right here where they belong in their heads, that's them being conservative. They're literally trying to conserve the status quo. Second Thought has several great videos on how the status quo serves fascism and capitalism. You should check them out there in the description to kind of explain how that works.
Abbott and Preach are correct in that to normal people who still have not developed certain analytical frames of gender and sexuality, leftist political activity looks crazy because it's greatly anti-hegemonic. Changing the status quo looks crazy to people invested in the status quo. They position themselves in the same frame of a Dave Chappelle or Joe Rogan, they insinuate that they are being unfairly attacked by extremists. But to prove their point, they only look at the most extreme examples of these conflicts and never fully engage with the systemic issues that are at the root of these problems. And if you've ever talked to a moderate or a centrist or, or anyone who is in this weird nebulous space of center left liberalism, what they come to is a general resistance of looking at things systemically. It's not that they disagree, it's that they just don't want to go that deep into the problem because that would probably make them uncomfortable both with their own behavior and beliefs, but also in the work that that might mean for them to change that. So they have to make it seem like you're crazy for thinking that in the first place. So what Abba and Preach do for their presumably young male audience is give them the language to acknowledge social problems, but not force them to digest how they may be a part of those problems and greatly absolves them of participation within those problems by just saying, hey, look at these crazy leftists and feminists. There's no way that what they're saying has any bearing on the issues that we're talking about. I'm picking on Abba and Preach, not because I find them so explicitly heinous, although there are clearly a lot of problems in their content, but in comparison to the world of content that they embody, they're relatively mild. But it's also that mildness that makes them maybe a little more dangerous as, again, this entry level of the manosphere. And while we should be highly critical of the message that these boys receive, as well as the messengers that profit off of it, I want us to again empathize with the need for boys to have avenues that help them make sense of the world around them in their youth. A paper published here, because I left it off the script, tells us that research on identity development indicates that men are more likely to go through phases of what's called identity foreclosure, which means they adopt the socially expected and enforced ideology of what they are and what they should be. Conversely, women and girls were more likely to go through phases of identity moratorium or exploration of who they are or might be or they go through what's called achievement and confirmation of an identity that they choose for themselves. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense when you look at how the way that patriarchy limits boys' understanding of what a boy or man can and could be, which limits their ability to actualize themselves outside of the framing of masculinity, the classic phrase that masculinity is a cage. And this is not to say that femininity is not compulsory all the same, but the parameters of that compulsion are very different. For an easy example of this, consider the way that bisexual men are treated when seeking out female partners versus the way that bisexual women are treated when seeking out male partners. By those bisexual men breaking the unspoken contract about what appropriate masculinity is supposed to be, aka not gay, there are lots of women who will never give them the time of day, but might also consider themselves feminists at the same time, which, yeah, that doesn't work. And I want to put a pin on why it's a really important and good thing that boys are getting opportunities to understand the world from an explicitly masculine perspective and why we on the left should care a lot more about the fact that so many boys are seeking affirmation through these venues and what that means that we should be doing about it outside of being critical and making fun of these types of figures. So to wrap things up, Ab and Preach are bad, but not as bad as they could be, I guess. I don't know. All right, so we've gotten through the top layers of the Manosphere Iceberg. What is next on the list? Oh, oh. Jordan Peterson, for my black viewers who may not know, is basically white Kevin Samuels. In fact, I'm pretty sure Kevin Samuels talks about Jordan Peterson in some of his content and read his book. <laughs> anybody, you know anybody me. in here familiar with Jordan Peterson? No, no. no. Dr. Jordan Peterson. Dr. Jordan Peterson, he's a psychiatrist, psychologist out of uh, Canada. There are a few differences, though. While both appeal to vulnerable and emotionally damaged boys and young men seeking guidance and support from a masculine voice, Samuels' rhetoric is overtly misogynistic, while Peterson combines subtle misogyny with a sprinkle of racism, a few scoops of homophobia, and a whole lot of transphobia. Do you think men and women can work in the workplace together? I don't know. Without sexual harassment? 
We'll see. Here's a rule. Don't, don't How about you... no makeup in the workplace? Why would that be a rule? I don't know why. Why do you make on... your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal. While Samuels' fan base is vulnerable black men and some women who have been fighting and arguing in these ongoing gender wars for the last however many years in black pop culture, Peterson's rhetoric has become a useful tool for legitimizing white supremacists and fascist movements and validating regressive and oppressive ideologies and policies in westernized nations. While Samuels has made himself pretty popular on YouTube and Instagram and done a few decent sized podcasts and online interviews, Peterson, despite the affinity that white supremacists and the alt-right have for his content and his overt trans and homophobic phobia has been mainstreamed and appeared on numerous national media outlets and highly syndicated podcasts. Most of your viewers will have watched Pinocchio. Probably. There's a scene in Pinocchio where Geppetto wishes on a star. I wish I may, I wish I may. And so he lifts his eyes up above his daily concerns and he says, what I want. What? What I want more than anything else is that my creation will become a genuine individual, right? It's, it's a heroic gesture because it's so unlikely. And that catalyzes the puppet's transformation into a real being. And we start as puppets. It greatly speaks to the big differences between the white and black manosphere. Black men simply are not allowed to exert this type of influence and power to spread toxic or even just transgressive ideologies without impunity, which is fine. Like I'm not arguing for these guys to get more attention, but it's important to recognize how white men wield these harmful ideas differently and with a different level of impunity. Whiteness protects them and makes the damage that they do much greater and much bigger of a threat. At the same time, Peterson does have a few features that explain how and why he's been mainstream. Aside from being white, he's also an established professor of psychology at one of the more prominent universities in Canada. He has written three books and was very accomplished as a professor for years before entering the public eye. He, in some ways, challenges the hegemonic ideal of masculinity. It's honestly what makes him such an elusive and dangerous figure in the first place. While every other figure in these Manosphere Streets has a very basic and stereotypical image of masculinity based in their style or status or success with women, Peterson focuses on masculinity manifesting through religion, discipline, temperament, strong relationships, and honesty. You kind of want to tangle your life together with someone, you know, because you have someone to, well, it's like two ropes that are tangled together. It's stronger, especially during times of weakness. And you have two brains instead of one. And that actually turns out to be really helpful when sure. things are complicated. And and it builds a solidity into your life and a, and a, and a reality into your life to have someone who's along with you on this very long voyage. And so I think that deepens your life in a way that isn't really possible with fragmentary relationships as a single person. Definitely. Really a lot of very good and important principles that if they were the focus of how men saw the hegemonic ideal, this video probably wouldn't be so long. And that's the stuff that he tends to focus on. Like this probably makes up 80% of all of his content. Like Jordan Peterson is such a like, he's like a fucking like siren on the rocks for like fucking like lonely white dudes. Like he's, He's so, he like, I never really got it, like, at first, because I was like, this guy's got a weird voice. He seems odd. Like, I don't, I don't think he's going to be that big. But something about his message and the way that he speaks to this specific group, this disenfranchised, like, you know, white guy group, uh, the way he speaks to them is he's so skilled at that. Like, in a way that I think a lot of these other kind of IDW, Joe Rogan podcast types... Right. They don't really have, they don't have it like he does. And to his credit, he has been pretty explicit on various occasions to express how he doesn't support the Manosphere label or being grouped in with the alt-right and white supremacists and that he does not like them or all the stuff that they are connected to. And he hates identity politics, no matter whose identity it is. And as much as he is the darling of right-leaning and white supremacist spaces, he is just as hated by many of them as well. And we'll come back to that. He is definitely loved and valued by large portions of the less toxic manosphere population who are just seeking ways to help and his overall prescription is less toxic and more real and honest so aside from the queer and transphobia you might be asking well what's the big deal and that's the problem 
The queer and transphobia are indicative of the endpoint to Peterson's unique form of weepy, gentle voice fascism. Peterson has this evolved image of masculinity that weaves through his work, and while his teachings have proven genuinely valuable and useful for a population of boys who feel lost in the drift in meaninglessness, nihilism, and aimless anger, his views and work are still very traditional and very unevolved in terms of being critical of the hierarchies and systems that create that anger and nihilism that I'm speaking about here. In fact, Peterson seems to have an almost pathological disdain for anything that threatens hierarchies and the status quo. Peterson believes deeply in the value of hierarchies and not tearing them down, even though he acknowledges that some are bad. He sees the radical left and the postmodern Marxists or something as inherently seeking to destroy civilization. We've seen the rapid expansion of identity politics throughout the universities. It's, came, it's come to dominate all of the humanities, which are, which are dead as far as I can tell, and a huge proportion of the social scientists, sciences. And we've been publicly funding extremely radical postmodern leftist thinkers who are hell-bent on demolishing the fundamental substructure of Western civilization. And that's no, that's no paranoid delusion. And if you extrapolate his rhetoric to its logical endpoint, then you recognize that he sees chaos as a world where white men are no longer centered in major institutions of power. He doesn't say this explicitly, but so much of his rhetoric is clearly extrapolated to say that the world is as good as it's going to get and it would be better if we would just let competent, strong white men do what they do. He is prone to saying something along the lines of equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome which is his way of reifying the status quo and cautioning against changing it. He is open to the ideas that hierarchies are tyrannical and corrupt and produce inequality, but very resistant to really doing anything about it. And when you see the way that he responds to the fact that things might be slightly changing and Christian straight white men are having to rethink their place in the world, his reaction is often over the top and intense. The fundamental assumptions of Western civilization are valid. How about that? You know, it's not... You think it's an accident? Oh, here's how you find out, okay? Which countries do people want to move away from? Hey, not ours. Which countries do people want to move to? Ours. And sure, he will say over and over again that he isn't racist and that this isn't about race and he hates the alt-right and identity politics. But when you listen to the way he talks about equality and egalitarianism as bad things, and you hear him defend hierarchies, all of which in the West are obviously controlled by white men, but never mentioning that particular piece, and the way he attacks critical theories that are meant to deconstruct that, and then you see him posing with Pepe the Frog and hanging around with Lauren Southern and... That's gotta be racist, there's no way. Like here he is clearly engaging in a systemic analysis of how race determines criminality and unfair outcomes of sentencing, policing, etc. Like, well, look, one of the things I was interested in talking to you about, you've written a fair bit about diff racial differences in incarceration in the United States. Yeah. And you, you've made a case, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I'm, I'm trying to sum up what I understand. Yeah. That the fact of those differential incarceration rates not only has a variety of negative, medium and long term consequences for everyone, um, but that it does point to a kind of system, systemic problem that's fundamentally discriminatory. And here he is calling the idea of systemic racism insidious and false. I've been thinking about this idea of systemic racism a lot lately, and it's a very, very treacherous term. And and purposefully so, I believe. But then there's this systemic issue, you mm -hmm. see, and that's what, and that sort of snuck in there, systemic. Well, systemic implies central tendency. And here he is crying at the idea of it being harder for white men to get girlfriends. It's so sad that so many of these men, you know, they've not had an encouraging bloody word, a real encouraging word in their entire life. It just takes a little bit of, 
of encouragement and care so that they're willing to set themselves straight to some degree and start trying. It's just a catastrophe that that's, that's so rare in their lives. And what he's being critical of here is the fact that cishet white men like him and his favorite students and his friends maybe, and the many men that follow him are going to have to lose some privilege for everyone else to address the inequality that he swears is not at all systemic. And he will argue his point valiantly and in circuitous and uninspired parables and metaphors and non sequiturs. But the fact is, he just really doesn't care about the issues of those less fortunate. In a weird way, he completely admits this and kind of sees this as the core of what the left is, which makes his antagonism towards it even more gross. What about disparity of distribution? So there's the problem of absolute level of wealth, let's say. That's improving, but there is still tremendous disparity. And of course, that that is fair enough. You could even point out that the role of the left is to provide a conscientious voice for, for that's constantly attending to the fact of continuing disparity regardless of absolute level of wealth, and, and fair enough. Because the sad and funny thing is, if he really cared about these men that he's writing these books for, he would recognize how these same systems and hierarchies that he so fervently and passionately supports are the core reason why his core audience is suffering the way they do. And it's hilarious when you think about it, because for all the crying about great replacement that is woven through Peterson's rhetoric is really a bunch of nonsense at a material level. Even he said that the world on so many measures is better off now than at any time in history. So many things have happened in the last 40 years that are so good, you just can't believe it. I mean, we've lifted more people out of abject poverty in the last 15 years than in the entire course of human history, in terms of sheer numbers of people. You know, and starvation, except for political reasons, is now pretty much absent across the world. He cries at the idea of white men feeling bad about themselves because they might need to use someone else's pronouns to not be considered rude. Like if white men were so starved for meaning and representation, you would think they'd, I don't know, pay attention to most of the fucking world. Instead of complaining that a black guy is going to be Doctor Who, they would just watch the other 30 years of white Doctor Who. A funny thing occurred to me in the like production of this, this is the last part of this video, thank God. We see this constant crying and whining from the alpha male advocates, white supremacists, anti-SJWs, et cetera, about how real men and real masculinity is disappearing and the media doesn't want you to see it. But despite that, so many of these guys aren't all that interested in supporting or getting behind the traditional images that are present half the time. Remember a little while ago, God of War released concept art for Thor and they made him fat and awesome looking and burly and very manly. And these guys complained that he didn't look strong enough. He didn't look manly enough, which is weird because I'm pretty sure more of them look like this Thor than the Thor they now hate. But then just a few months ago, The Northman came out and this was a movie that was so white and Viking that people just memed it into being automatically racist, which maybe wasn't fair at the end of the day. Because it turns out that The Northman was a fucking amazing movie, an insane trip to watch, and definitely not for everybody, but amazing. And yes, there is zero melanin in it, no representation of any queer anything, just pure hetero boning, lots of gory violence and manly grunts and gore. And there's like a Viking boss battle in the middle of the movie out of nowhere and just all kinds of other awesome shit that I don't want to spoil. And it bombed. And it's not because they didn't try. Like I saw tons of advertisement for this movie. So I know that other males in my general demographic saw the same thing, but these white men that are just so starred for alpha male representation in the media were too busy complaining about woke Thor or seeing red to go watch a movie about fucking Vikings. Like y'all know a bunch of black people went to see red tails like 20 years ago and it sucked and we saw it anyway. To the last bullet, to the last minute, to the last man, we fight, we fight, we fight, we fight, we fight. We fight. We fight. We fight. That's what it feels like to be starred for representation in the media, that we had whole family events to go see fucking red tails. Back to Peterson. Even though he doesn't use the usual bigoted, racist, homophobic, or transphobic rhetoric that 
other conservative and right-leaning figures do, it's impossible to completely disentangle him from those political standpoints because his rhetoric, while more polite and with fancier words, essentially seeks the same outcome as those on the right that he outwardly professes to despise. And what annoys me to no end is that he doesn't want to acknowledge that he's being pulled into the alt-right and neo-Nazi movements for a reason. And so many defenders of him when it comes to this particular criticism act like they can't imagine why a guy who openly supports hierarchical power of straight white men and offers smart sounding arguments for it would ever find fans among conservatives, the alt-right and neo-Nazis. And I want to address that ongoing debate that the alt-right and neo-Nazis don't like Peterson. Peterson has been very open about his dislike for them, and at times he almost seems to regret the fact that he's been recuperated into their rhetoric. They haven't been able to find one thing I've said in 30 years that, uh, what would you say, justifies any of those accusations, or any other accusations for that matter. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite the phenomena. I mean, I understand it to some degree. I don't buy this argument that they don't like him and see how his rhetoric is valuable for their cause, or at least clearly didn't at one time. One video that attempts to make this argument makes it pretty clear that while surely some notable figures on the alt-right and among neo-Nazis don't like Peterson because they consider him a half measure, which again, I really wish his fan base would digest that a bit more. Cause like being half a Nazi, still not good. But they wouldn't be talking about him and trying to attack him the way they do if they clearly didn't have a lot among them who like him and found his rhetoric valuable for their cause. What else is there to say about these people except that they're dangerous to say the least and not as much of a gateway to us as some alt writers like to think. If anything, they are gatekeepers and speed bumps that allow people to take the easy way out of confronting the social malaise of our times. They're halfway rest stops that allow people turned off by the rabid SJW left to counter signal their opposition in a comfortable way and without embracing white identity. In the responses in these videos about what the Nazis are saying negatively about Peterson, they're basically saying Peterson isn't fascist enough, which, and let's not forget, Peterson, like Samuels, was nothing special, not well known, not widely understood to be a figure or a player in political or psychological discourse until he found a voice in a reactionary conservative movement seeking to harm marginalized people. For Samuels, it was a viral video of him embarrassing a black woman. And for Peterson, it was him participating in a protest against trans rights organized with known white supremacist Lauren Southern. Imagine that, what? what? You have no idea if I'm your enemy. You have no idea about me. You won't Nothing use my pronouns, so I'm pretty sure you're my enemy, yes. Yeah, well, I know you think that, but <laughs> I don't believe that using your pronouns is going to do you any good in the long run. I think it'll do quite the contrary. What? All of this stuff is subterfuge because Peterson doesn't act like a chud and a Nazi. He says semi-okay things openly distances himself and genuinely seems to care about men and boys, and he's clearly helped a lot of people. But his care for them is centered on their role in the hegemony, the, the hierarchy of white men at the top and everyone else under. And to try to alter that from his perspective is literally sinful. And that brings it to the most concerning part of Peterson and why he's on this far end of the spectrum from my perspective, even though ostensibly he's much less openly toxic is that he is mainstreaming these dangerous views and ideas that clearly align with the most extreme elements that can be found in the manosphere. That, of course, isn't his fault. That's the fault of our sensational entertainment media that just can't help be curious about the cuddly Canadian with the weird voice who the Nazis really like. And wow, I wonder why that is. All of these figures I've talked about exist in a relative niche space that has to be found and recruited to Peterson is making headway into mainstream venues and drawing a straight line between vulnerable white boys and men looking for meaning and support in a chaotic world and literal Nazis. Good job, bro. But these are the types of things you don't care about when you're not affected by the dangers of being lower on the hierarchy. Peterson, much like the edge lords I talked about at the beginning of this video, don't have fear that their rights are being taken away or that there are people that are trying to stop them from existing or having abortions or having access to good health care 
or having their history effectively taught in schools or trying to engage with the structural barriers that hold them back or what the ramifications of enforced monogamy might be. It's silly and funny to get all triggered to them because there's no sense of fear in what these things mean. It's all the negligible whining of triggered snowflakes, simps, cucks, SJWs, and radical postmodern leftists. We're all just a bunch of idiots looking for something to complain about until somebody finally comes to shoot up a store. Tonight, authorities say the alleged shooter planned it all. I am much more likely to die from heart disease than of gun violence even less likely to die in an active shooter event. Women ages 20 to 40 are more likely to die of an unintentional injury or suicide than homicide. But for those homicides, over one third are killed by former intimate partners. I'm bringing up heart disease and accidents to make sure that we understand that the threats to our lives are much more often things far less sensational than being the victim of a spree shooter or some other form of domestic terrorism or even an act of intimate partner violence. That said, the impact that these types of events and stories have on our daily lives and psyches is not to be disregarded. That's what terrorism is. And the patterns present in certain types of violence by men and boys, both white and black, cannot be ignored. I don't think I'm saying anything special to point out that white supremacists, insoles, and insole adjacent ideologies are overrepresented in the modern history of spree shooters. Insoles, for anyone who has made it this far into this video and somehow doesn't know, stands for involuntarily celibate. And although it was coined by a woman blogger who wanted to discuss her experiences with struggling with intimacy, it was co-opted by young white males as becoming an identity for them to gather around and gripe about not just their difficulties with intimacy, but how the core of their difficulties to them lies in an oppressive social system controlled by women that marginalizes them as men who somehow lost the genetic lottery. What I will give the insoles is that they, like some of these other figures in the manosphere, actually have great critical thinking skills to an extent. They did a great job of analyzing the social systems of attracting and partnering and hierarchies across race and gender and economics, etc. They understand access to a man's capital and lookism and ableism and race will dictate not just a man's options for romantic partnership, but also their ability to do well in life to even attract a mate. From a sociological standpoint, the grounded theory of these Crazed incel rants on gender and sex are actually rich with kind of effective analysis. The problem is that akin to other manosphere spaces is that at the end of the day, at the end of all this analysis that breaks down these hierarchies, their response is to say, OK, let's keep the hierarchy and figure out a way to put us on the top of it. And that that's not how this works. Insoles are kind of the tip of the spear when it comes to the worst elements of the manosphere, along with the remnants of the pickup artist community, which seems to have died down and maybe was watered down into whatever fresh and fit and alpha male podcasts are, along with men going their own way or MGTOWs who conversely have decided to live lives without the toxic influence of women. These are like the triumvirate of the most toxic of the manosphere communities. But understand, that's not where it ends. So much of the manosphere is closer to dumb annoyance than existential threat because they express bad ideas and harass and dox people online, etc. But overall, they aren't really an explicit existential threat like, say, white supremacists and Nazis, unless, of course, they are actual white supremacists and Nazis. I can see the conservative movement is slowly coming back around to its implicit racism of the old of the old days. You know, like I remember when Obama was president, there definitely was some thinly veiled, you know, racism there. The thing with the manosphere is that there's a contingent of that space that follows from problematic but overall non-threatening stuff like your Gary V or Abin Preach and find their way into outright fascist and neo-Nazi activity or similarly right-leaning organizations or belief systems prone to violence. And to be clear and maybe surprise some of you, this is not something that only affects young white boys and men. A factoid that I think many people are going to scoff at is that depending on how you define it, spree shooters or mass shooters 
are not disproportionately white. A paper published in the Journal of Current Sociology in 2016 was one of the first to do a full on analysis of mass killings and race in America. And it found that mass killings as defined by the killing of more than three people in a single incident that found that the rate of mass killings mostly mimic the racial dynamics of murder race in general, and that white males are only slightly overrepresented among mass killings. In fact, the ethnic group most overrepresented among mass killings was actually Asian men. Now, of course, this means by virtue of population dynamics, white boys and men commit a lot more spree shootings as a raw count. And like most crimes, the victims will be in community with you. Thus, white mass killers are more likely to kill other white people and black killers the same. So this means that when white mass killers attack and they kill other white people, this guarantees, for the most part, much more media attention and public outrage, except for in those cases such as with Buffalo or what happened with Dylan Roof in South Carolina, where it's a clearly racially motivated issue and it does get national headlines because people love to watch black pain. On the flip side, black men who commit these types of acts, it's often a very very different crime altogether. For black men who do mass killings, they're often in the process of some other illegal activity, such as a robbery that goes wrong in some form or fashion and people end up getting shot. They're much less likely to do one of these things in public for no apparent reason, which I'll get to in a second. But one thing to think about is that as generally defined, the definition of mass killings often doesn't include black men who have similar activities and motivations as their white counterparts, but the crimes are slightly different, such as the cases of Christopher Dorner, Brian Nichols, John Allen Muhammad, or Steve Stevens, all black men who went on some form of a murderous rampage, but because it wasn't a mass killing all at one time in a public venue, it doesn't really fit the description of a spree shooting. There's a lot of different variables you can investigate to figure out differences between white spree shooters, black spree shooters, Asian, whatever. But the thing that's the same between all of them, the thing that's pretty much the same worldwide about this phenomenon is that it's almost always men and it's almost always heterosexual men. And that so many of these events are directly tied to a sense of reclaiming power that these men feel has been lost. So with black men, you see that there is still a form of misogynistic and misanthropic rhetoric that permeates a lot of these men's behavior and does have the ability to spill into random acts of violence. Gavin Long, who shot three police officers in Baton Rouge, sent his manifesto to Boyce Watkins of all people, notable like diet manosphere staple that's been around for years. In 2009, Asia McGowan, a small time YouTuber, was murdered by a peer on her college campus who was a raging misogynist and an avid consumer of old school black manosphere content. And just a few months ago, the New York train shooting that happened was committed by an older black man who reportedly was an avid consumer of misogynistic manosphere content. We're gonna be watching Tommy Sotomayor. And some of you know who Tommy is. Tommy is a long time uh, YouTube. He's been around for at least longer than I have, probably about 12. Yeah, about 12 years, I'd say. You know, he's he's big, he's, he's, he's been, he's, he's, he's amazing YouTube. He's, you know, he's, he uh, has built his channel up. And this isn't considering how manosphere content might affect black men who aren't committing mass violence. I wanna be clear that the murder rate for black women and black trans women has no explicit reported ties to the manosphere except for in those specific singular cases. But you can't deny that this world that normalizes misogyny and hatred of women at that level cannot be making the world safer for black women. That said, when it comes to this extreme end of the manosphere and how it manifests into senseless violence, we are still mostly talking about white men and boys, and I guess to some extent, Asian men and boys. And in this case, there's a lot of research to recognize how this connects to how they perform and perceive masculinity. Police didn't have to search long to learn what motivated a 22-year-old gunman to kill six people and injure seven others. Before doing so, he posted a 141-page manifesto, mostly blaming women for not having sex with him. The same study that I mentioned earlier points out a few significant features. One is that white males are much more likely to carry out spree shootings in public places, killing relatively indiscriminately, and that white spree shooters have a significantly higher body count when they commit their spree shootings. Furthermore, in their interpretation of this data, they take the stance to put crime-related shootings of multiple people on the same level as a kid going into a grocery store and shooting only black people. And while there are some reasons that might connect those two crimes on a thematic level, it's pretty clear 
what the difference is. So you have to take that only slight white skewing with a subtle grain of salt. And this gives us a lot to consider about how racial identity and privilege connects to these events. And to explain, let's finally get back to talking about Attack on Titan. Attack on Titan is an anime show based off a manga that started in 2009. And it's not your usual Dragon Ball or Pokemon or something maybe more puerile. It's the closest thing that I think anime has gotten to Game of Thrones with an intense story with lots of characters, very dark, complex themes around racism and politics, war, etc. And some insane plot twists. For years, it was looking to be my favorite anime slash manga of all time until it got to its last arc. So, yeah, it's a lot like Game of Thrones, actually. In the last arc of the story, Aaron Yeager, the story's protagonist, goes from being a plucky, typical shonen protagonist with lots of angst and whining and maybe some awesome moments of friendship and perseverance and selflessness, and he turns into a cold and calculated genocidal fascist with abs. It's a relatively startling character shift that I was initially on board with just out of curiosity and hope that the writer who had shown some concerning inclinations over the years to be low key into fascism, that maybe none of that was true and that he would bring it all together in a way that made sense. He did not. Without going completely through this story, which is 11 years long, just understand that in the last part of the last arc, Aaron has kind of become a death god and is fighting his friends who are trying to stop him from completing yet another cataclysmic doomsday plan because he's a fucking edgelord. Except, spoiler alert, he does it. He pulls it off. His friends don't stop him until he's killed nearly 80% of the world's population. He commits a massive global genocide, and the story treats this so casually and matter-of-factly that it blows my mind. And why did he do this? Well, it's complex and hard to decipher, but it boils down to because we live in a society, because he had the power to do so. The rumbling, his doomsday activity, has many of the characteristics of your typical spree shooting, and I fucking hate it. I reread this chapter and watched a ton of analysis videos on this moment, trying to make sense of why the author and so much of the fan base was okay with this being a part of what the ending to the story was, and wasn't completely taken out of the story by this type of ending or seeing it as such an ugly and ridiculous and kind of abhorrent thing to just kind of casually put out there to a large fan base of what amounts to young people and children. Why were so many fans okay with the ending being a global genocide that also had the byproduct of leaving much of the world under control of fascist regimes? Regimes, regimes, what is regimes? Just leave it in. And the most sensible answers I could find were numerous arguments saying that Aaron had no control, that he was destined to do this based on some complex story elements that I won't fully get into. But when you go back and you read the reasoning that he gives in the story, it sounds like some shit a spree shooter would literally say. You forced me into a corner and gave me only one option. The decision was yours. Now that the slate has been cleaned and you have the world's attention, the question is, what are you going to do? Seong Hee Cho, Virginia Tech. Just like me, those people were denied everything they deserved, everything they wanted. Though we may have been born bad, society left us no recourse. No way to be good. I have been forced to align myself with demonic forces. Chris Harper Mercer, Oregon. I am the good guy. Humanity struck at me first by condemning me to experience so much suffering. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. I didn't start this war. I wasn't the one who struck first, but I will finish it by striking back. I will punish everyone. Elliot Roger, Isla Vista, California. I have fought and fought, always defending against eradication and the fallibility of man. There's one more battle to fight with life, to face death, embrace the long-standing hatred of mankind, and overcome all fear. James E. Holmes, Littleton, Colorado. In order to completely destroy the cycle of hatred and revenge, we must destroy this hatred's history. We must eradicate it with the very civilizations that harbor it. Aaron Yeager, Attack on Titan. The story muddles Aaron's motivation by indicating that he was forced to do this by a separate entity, but it's not ultimately clear who was really in control. And to me, it doesn't matter because again, if you read the words of many spree shooters, you'll hear similar statements about how they were forced to do these things by a voice in their head or fate or society, that it was their destiny. And it grosses me out that so few in the fan base are bothered by the inconsequential way the story and characters treat this end result, that this 
nonsensical plan to genocide the world for peace for once actually happened and the characters left are like, yeah, sorry about it. Let's put a meeting on the calendar to figure out what to do next. But I feel that this is because the reader base has a similarly perverse relationship to a sense of power and entitlement as Aaron Yeager. A grandiose sense of self-centeredness that if you have the power in a situation, then you have the right to use it however you see fit. The reason why white shooters shoot more in public places is because they feel comfortable there. They feel entitled to have dominion over those spaces. The reason why they have higher body counts is because they plan their attacks out more for maximum lethality. They have the resources to buy the most lethal means of attack, to buy body armor, and probably more significantly, to plan and act uninhibited because the police and other authorities don't respond to them with the same level of urgency that they do others before and after their shooting. It's already an odd coincidence that so many white shooters get to just surrender peacefully. Charleston shooting suspect Dylan Storm Roof got a free meal from police on his way to jail. They went to Burger King. Another thing that a lot of people don't know is that many of these shooters were encountered by police before their shootings, and many of them were in some form of state supervision that they should have been seen. Their action should have been stopped before they actually had a chance to commit their acts of violence. These men, like Aaron Yeager, don't have the power to do the things that would make the world right for them. They don't have the power to undo their traumas, to fix the social structures that harm them, or to change the things that cause them pain. But they do have the power to deliver death to other people, and that's what motivates them. When you look at the motivations of black street shooters, you see motives often tied to entitlement, but usually connected to a specific issue, police brutality, a jilted lover revenge on a place of employment. Still abhorrent acts, but within a frame of reality that most people can make sense of. But for these white spree shooters, they're literally playing God. If you read their manifestos, many of them explicitly express this desire to feel godlike. This is obviously bigger than any specific creator in the manosphere and beyond the scope of just regular old misogyny. And remember, spree shootings, even as they alarmingly increase in rate, are extreme outliers in terms of violence. But it doesn't take much research to notice that so many spree shooters express racist and or misogynistic ideals and often act after a breakup or rejection from a girl. The Manosphere has never put a gun in anyone's hands. But as I've been saying up to now, the regressive rhetoric and ideas around women and power and how to be a real man, how to affirm the status quo, that lays the groundwork for the worst and most disturbed and extreme figures that come to this space to rationalize later acts of violence. And we're back. Ooh. And uh, there might be a little noise in the background because it's nighttime and motherfuckers are having a party it is what it is uh, i want to kind of re-engage with some of the uh aaron yeager slander um because as i put this out early for patrons and even just mentioning on twitter seeing the thumbnail with aaron yeager on it i was somewhat surprised that the biggest pushback i got immediately was the idea that I might slander Aaron Yeager, a individual that I've complained about multiple occasions at this point, like literally my first signified B-Sides videos. By the way, please go to the signified B-Sides channel to check out the side channel. I do a little stuff, quick plug there. And I think it's great because it gives me a real time current example of something I've, I mentioned in the Edge Lord video last year, which is for all the conversation that people want to have about something obviously being a theme or part of a story where you're not supposed to see Aaron Yeager as a, as a good guy, you're not supposed to support the fascist activity that is happening at the end of the story. Like a lot of people will come and say, these are just characters. Anime characters do this all the time, yada, yada, yada. And no. I, no, I'm sorry. First off, it's questionable, at least from my perspective, to say that Isayama, the writer of Attack on Titan, does not low-key support fascism. That he is, on some level, a Japan restorationist. Japan has a neutrality policy that they've had since World War II to not engage in any type of militaristic activity. The citizens of Parody, the main place where this story takes place, Aaron Yeager's homeland, also has an oath of neutrality to not bring the Titans back from wherever they were, a bunch of stuff. There's like a lot out there that indicates that 
Maybe he doesn't have the type of fascism that we're used to thinking about, but there's clearly a fascistic belief system that is sublimating beneath the surface of this show. And it's hard to say whether Ryder actually lands on that. And that in and of itself, to me, is a problem, especially when you start to dig into some of the details that I put out here in this section or many other people that have pointed out that Aaron Yeager kind of seems like he's been a sociopath this entire time and they just kind of either hid it or made it seem like maybe sociopathy is the way to go. A very small creator named Lost Futures made a video that actually referenced my first video and came to the exact same conclusion that I came to, which is that it's a lot of fascistic stuff in there, except they went on ahead and did a lot of research on fascism in Japan. I'm not going to go through the entire of this guy's video, but it's a very good video that is providing a pretty compelling argument that the entirety of the show is kind of pro-fascist. And, you know, you can argue that it's not. You can argue that some people are just misunderstanding that the arguments that it's pro-fascist are weak. But just like with my argument about Jordan Peterson, if it's halfway there, that's too close. And the other thing is you can go and you can look on my channel page in the community section. You can see some of the comments in support of Aaron Yeager. You can go and look at my post on Twitter. And you can see some of the arguments in support on Aaron Yeager or just Google the shit, especially on Reddit. And you'll see that while it's arguable to say whether or not the show and Aaron Yeager in particular are fascist in terms of their undertones and like important themes, I compare it to what I said in that old Edgler video in the previous video about the Joker and Travis Bickle and the guy from falling down Walter White Rick from Rick and Morty so many of these characters that are these you know Sigma male edge Lord we live in a society type characters are arguably meant to deconstruct that mindset and show why that's a bad thing but too many dudes do not get that there are too many boys and young men that idolize that type of power and that don't give a fuck edgy antisocial attitude towards the world to recognize that the message in those stories is to reject that mindset they just don't get it and again look in the comment section do your own search for those of you that are on the fence you will see what i'm talking about so yeah i survived the barbs i'll survive the weebs if you got a problem with it it is what it is For most of you, I'm not saying anything you don't already know. In fact, I imagine that if you're here on the left side of YouTube, that almost everything I've spoken about here is pretty well understood on some level. So my question is, what are we doing about this? Of all of the topics and issues that we on the left understand and argue about, there is no bigger weakness in our rhetoric, in our ideas, than our ability to understand and engage with masculinity. And I can show you right now my analytics that the majority of my viewership are men. So this speaks to this idea that there is such a great demand for anti-SJW content and that leftist and progressive content is not as viable with this population. So this begs the question, even though, of course, I am not as big as some of these other Manosphere creators, can we blame YouTube for pulling people deeper into these holes if they aren't actively being sucked in by YouTube's algorithm? The research says no. Noah Sampson addressed this in the video a little while back, and I found two different papers published in the last couple of years that also support this claim. Both found that the only people who fell deep into those types of rabbit holes of aggressive, violent, racist, etc. content were people who greatly were predisposed to that type of worldview to begin with, i.e. ones who are already looking for. The algorithm and YouTube on its own is not as powerful as we like to think in terms of radicalizing normies at least not anymore. I think this is something significant to understand. On one end, I am somewhat skeptical of the research because the one question I have is that what counts as predisposed for that type of content? So much of how we teach boys and men to see masculinity could easily predispose a good amount of young men to pursue radical content. But more significantly, if we recognize that there is a battle for the proliferation of certain ideas among this population, but we still see the massive influence and reach of everything between Gary Vee onto Jordan Peterson for men and boys, then to me that says that we aren't really putting our best foot forward to address this on the left. A video essayist, Macabre Storytelling, did a pretty awesome video on his experience with 
pickup artist communities. He bravely admitted that he had unironically spent some time in the community and then got out and while in, he noticed that most of the men were just normal men who were like him, trying to get better at talking to women. He also noticed that although he could see the flaws in the community and that there were several great content creators who had done excellent breakdowns of why pickup artistry was bad. When it was time for him to find a better alternative to pickup artistry and manosphere type content, a lot of these creators didn't have as much to offer. Whoa there. These guys may seem like you're saving grace, but their methods may lead to you only seeing women as objects to be one. Ah, yes, I can see that. Glad you let me know this before I got too deep into it. Bye, cringe lords. No. Awesome. So can you help me? Uh, help you with what? Well, like I said, I am pretty insecure when it comes to women. Oh, well, just be confident. Just be confident? Yeah, just, you know, be confident. There's plenty of fish in the sea. You'll, you'll find the right girl eventually. Well, thanks, but I, I, I was hoping for some more substantial advice. Like, my mom told me the exact same thing, and it isn't really all that practical or specific, so there may be a... Hello? And to me, more than the Edgelord stuff, more than any dunks I landed on Jordan Peterson, this is the most important takeaway I hope people get from this video. Like I, my, honestly, I've improved my life so much by examining my own toxic masculinity and examining my own, like, why don't I let myself cry? Why don't, why is that? Who am I trying to impress? I, uh, that has only been, been good for me. That's, that has been a, a vast improvement in my life. And I wish that for, for everyone. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, right? I guess like the, all of these alienated, like white dudes who are susceptible to the, uh, the PewDiePie pipeline, um, types, like they are looking for, for guidance. They're looking for some, some answer to their, their problems. And I can definitely like understand, like it, it would be nice to have somewhere on the left that was speaking to that, that group. I'm the one who's being oppressed here. Like, how dare you accuse me of like feeding into that. And like that, that defensiveness, it makes it very difficult to um, pull people out in some cases when they're, you know, they've gotten caught up in these uh, movements. I understand that there are some barriers in terms of how well we can talk about it, as well as how well we can give that message to individuals who maybe aren't that open-minded to it, or if they are, are not going to necessarily be the best folks to engage with on a regular basis in this type of political discourse. Many of the biggest figures on Left Tube are women, but Left Tube is not without its fair share of creators who, regardless of gender expression or sexuality, present masculine and have large swaths of mass viewers who they appeal to. So it's not an absence of opportunity, it's kind of an absence of efficiency and effort. And again, I understand why. So much of how all of us have been taught to understand masculinity is built around these destructive and toxic frameworks. So many of us, myself included, are in a constant negotiation with masculinity as something we value and identify with, but also something we've had to in some ways unpack and relearn in order to get healthier. Some of us don't know how to define perform and embody masculinity without the toxic elements that we agree shouldn't be there. A few weeks ago, Kendrick Lamar released what amounts to a recorded therapy session for black men in the form of an album, and I think it was great. The album manages to address black men's internal struggles with trauma and masculinity and toxicity and queer and transphobia in a way that I never could. But in the process, he misgendered and dead named and, and even platformed a known predator in the hip hop community. I would argue that even those bad parts of this album make it even more effective for addressing and engaging with a population of black men who are not gonna read Antonio Gramsci anytime soon. But at the same time, I don't have the same perspective as film and queer participators in this discourse that feel put off and uncomfortable at this type of rhetoric being loosely used in any situation. I hope this doesn't sound like complaining. I hope it sounds like the numerous layers of complexity around engaging with masculinity from this weird progressive standpoint and why I feel like a lot of men on the left maybe just avoid the minefield altogether. On one end, there's an innate fear of making the wrong move or saying the wrong thing and maybe getting canceled. 
But also there is an innate fear, I think, that we somehow end up reproducing the same problems and frameworks that we are hoping to defeat. It's like it's like super important to me now to not to not not even to not even be perceived as like someone that that, that is toxic to like progress, you know, you know, a lot of my old videos and old ideas, I still like basically agree with, but I'm like very careful about how I say things and what I say, because um, I don't I, I want it to be clear that, you know, whose team I'm not on, basically. When you see the way that some men on the left act, when you see how many a celebrity or professed male feminist shows themselves to be shitty in the long run when push comes to shove, you see how this fear is warranted. But we should also hopefully see that this is not an ideal state of affairs for our goals. And that by avoiding these topics and this whole area of gender discourse, we're only empowering our enemies to corner the market on that topic. So we aren't making things better by not being explicit about engaging masculinity in our work. No shade to anyone, but it's not hard to shit on chuds and make fun of alpha male podcasts or to call out obvious assholes doing the obvious asshole things. Those things are important, but they are also abundant on the platform. What we don't have is a lot of analysis on boyhood, men's experiences in sexuality and sexual development, men's body issues, and God forbid, some type of useful engagement with boys and men, learning how to talk to women and engaging in partnering. We've got some elements of that present, but we could be doing a lot more. I think a lot of people think that they're doing enough already. It's kind of like the it's kind of like being it's kind of like the difference between being not racist and being anti-racist. Mm. OK, I think it's great and amazing if you're not racist. You don't say slurs. Dude, that's freaking g give me some sick, dude. Nice one. Now, now that you're not racist, now that you don't hate women or now that you dunk on these like right wing guys, what are we going to do with these guys? Because we're looking at like a sea of dudes who need help. What are we going to do? But like, we feel like we should stop and end right there at that. We've debunked them. We've, we've destroyed them. We've turned down all of their stuff, right? What are we, what are we going to do now? Yeah. Like high five. Good job. What are we going to do now to um, reel these people back in? Cause we can't just stop there. That's where the anti-racism comes in. That's where the deprogramming comes in. There's been very little intentional guidance given to a lot of these men and boys around their specific standpoint in this process. The only ones speaking directly to them are the ones that tell them to resist that change. So shockingly, I have fans that are both fans of me and somehow Kevin Samuels. And the only thing that makes sense of that from my perspective is that these are young men and boys that are so hard up for useful images of black masculinity that they'll take damn near anything, even if it doesn't make sense when you put them together. As I'm able to do it because I'm also a very carbon copy expression of I'm the ve I'm the vehicle of of that patriarchy people see me and Tiana from Fab Socialism was the one that made me realize this the most she said I was afraid to click on your videos because you look like the type to do it you look like it and I was just like you know maybe I should change up my I should change up my thumbnails maybe I shouldn't put myself in the thumbnails and it was actually the folks from Standard, shout out to folks from Standard, that was just like, no, I think that that's the reason why you resonate because people see your picture. They see very much presenting masculine, strong, you know, bear type, and then you spit something different and it takes them for a loop. And that's really one last thing I wanna get across before I wrap this very long video up. There's a possibility that this long into the video that some of you do not agree with me, but you're watching all the way through just to make sure you've done your due diligence. I appreciate that. And maybe you're not interested in moving further left. Maybe you're a staunch conservative somehow in some form or fashion. Maybe you're one of the many men that liked me and a Kevin Samuels. Wherever you are in that spectrum, I don't need you to read Capital or Bell Hooks or anything else explicitly that is going to pull you into a leftist ideology. But what I will challenge you to do is to deconstruct how you see yourself as a man apart from the messages and images that you see in the manosphere that we have now so much proof and evidence is not helping you, is not helping us as men out here in the world. 
I get the appeal of easy laughs. I get the appeal of feeling like men aren't spoken for effectively in social media spaces and that somebody should do something about it. I understand that. And I understand that as a man who has felt the way you felt, as a man who has questioned my efficacy as a man at numerous times throughout my life, a man who felt the urge to read Neil Strauss's The Game. Yes, I'm putting it out there. I read that book in my early 20s because I felt probably how a lot of you feel. And had a lot of this Manosphere stuff existed 20 years ago, when I was trying to understand who I was as a man, you best believe I'd have got sucked in just like some of you all and I'd have prayed for this voice that I'm giving to you all now as a beacon to get the fuck out because it does not work. It is not helping you and it will not help you in the long run achieve the things that you say you want to achieve. Humble brag, achieve the things that I got before I even got on YouTube. Things I just got in my personal life, things that aren't perfect, that don't make me perfect or ideal as a man, but it's things some of you all say you all want. I'm no guru. I don't want to be that, but I at least want to be here to spread that message to you. Bruh, come on out the cave. If we can teach young men that they don't need to be that. I think that would be really, really healthy for them and really beneficial to society as a whole, because like everything bad I'm saying about young men and like the mindsets they have, we, we teach it to them, mm. you know, like we as a society breed that into them. And I think it's very easy to look at like some of the kind of uglier ways they behave and express themselves. But I mean, that's coming from somewhere, like something yeah. in the pipeline is going wrong. Right. Right. I, I have a lot of, sympathy for like dudes who still have to accept all that and have that ahead of them and i don't have a prescription for that other than to do your part support creators that you know are trying to do better masculine creators out there white and black claim ownership of your masculinity express it and celebrate it as a good part of who you are and who you strive to be don't let the chuds define masculinity for us and the world and the people watching put a flag down and stake your claim to the films, the non-binary, the trans, and everyone else in between, I beg you give us grace. You guys know the difference between a guy being shitty and a guy trying to figure things out. There's no room for ironic misogyny, of course, but there is room for growth and learning. Further, and here's where grace is important, you also can do your part. Patriarchy is genderless. The conversation around patriarchy and its consequences are too one-sided and men notice this, even those of us who know why it's a one-sided conversation. The ways in which non-men contribute to patriarchy seem to never get aired out and it does feel marginalizing within this space. The casually negative way we talk about men and boys is problematic. It feels like there are some people whose entire branding, aesthetic, and personality on Twitter is just niggas ain't shit and I'm sorry, I'm tired of it. As much grief and pain as many men can present within and outside of community, I understand. We still also need to resist the urge to be ironically homophobic or misandrist as soon as it's time to take issue with a man within or outside of community. This of course does not give boys and men carte blanche to act like assholes or center themselves in situations where it's not necessary. It just means that we all need to be more proactive and gracious to each other and focus on the whole of the problem as much as one could muster at least. I know that the reality is everyone isn't ready or able or willing to practice this type of radical empathy with men or with white men. It's hard to empathize with people who in many situations and in many ways mean harm to you. I am not asking those of us with the most to lose to carry the further burden of fixing men. I'm asking for your support and patience in allowing me and other men to do that for ourselves. And fuck, that's it. <sighs> wow, this was long. This is really long. Check out the research and the list of creators, like-minded, many black mass creators that are doing good work, that need your support, need your attention. Please check out the Patreon. The Patreon makes it so I can do long ass videos and take a month and a half to get them done and hopefully make them as good as this one will be. So 
yeah, that's all I got for y'all. Thank you for watching all of this. Peace.